Gray County. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, I'm David Shearman, welcome, and welcome to Politically Speaking Election Edition. I will be interviewing the candidates in Bruce Gray Owen Sound as we are in the middle of an election campaign. And my interview today is with Chris Newdorf, who is the candidate from the New Democratic Party. Chris, welcome. Good to have you here. Thanks. It's great to meet you. Yes, it's. Uh, we're, I should. I should actually add that we're doing this in some very unusual circumstances. Um, yeah, you, technology isn't exactly what we hoped it would be, but we made it work. So uh, always good to see that the technology can work and even when we have to cross our fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you're a first time um, or a new name in the political scene here in Bruce Gray Owen Sound. And I'm wondering, What's your background? Where do, where is your where do you come from? Uh, well, I was born in, uh, in Mississauga. Uh, poor credit, specifically. Uh, folks of poor credit always had a bit of an unusual pride in poor credit, so we call it a poor credit, Mississauga. <laughs> um, but I grew up there at least partly. When I was uh, about uh, thirteen, we moved to Guelph. Um, but I spent every summer in Bruce Gray, specifically uh, Bruce County and Oliphant. Um, and that's because my mother did the same when she was a child. Uh, their families really since the end of World War II uh, would come up every summer um, to enjoy the just amazing Bruce County experience. Um, so while I was in university, um, my mother and stepfather decided they wanted to move to Bruce County permanently. They had a home there and then when I finished my undergraduate studies, I did what most millennials do. I moved in back with my parents. Uh, and then I got a job as a supply teacher and then I worked my way into some contract teaching. And then as all that happened, I saved some money, was able to get a small place in Owen Sound. And um, at this point, I can't imagine living anywhere else. Now, I've been here for about uh, five years now. It doesn't feel like it, but uh, it's been about five years. And you're with Blue Water District School Board then? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So why did you choose to enter politics? Well, you know, uh, sometimes the timing picks you. <laughs> um, I, I've always cared deeply about politics. I've, I've, I've tried to, when I've taught the subject, when, I, when, I, when I've talked about the subject, I really believe that government has the power to really make people's lives better. Um, and I think that uh, there's an extraordinary possibility in coming together to create something as a community, anything from a city level to a global level. Um, I suppose in that respect, I've, I've always been kind of interested in getting involved in politics. When I moved to Owen Sound, I got involved with the NDP because I believe they do a lot of good things for lower income communities like ours. And in this election, uh, I was asked if I would stand for election. And I suppose I thought that if I really believed in this, I ought to be able to put my money where my mouth is. So uh, here we are. Um, and my chance to say what I think. <laughs> well, that's great. It's a. Uh, it's always interesting to hear the various reasons why people choose to enter politics. But as you you say, sometimes the moment chooses you. Now we're in the midst of COVID still, to almost two years, and I'm sure that's had an effect on your life as a teacher. Mm -hmm. But. Um, there's been a huge or a significant amount of economic inequity exposed in Canada by the by the COVID pandemic. What will your party do to uh, remediate some of that inequity and address some of the issues which COVID has exposed? Well, some of the core things we want to do is it, um, address the housing crisis and the student debt crisis. And uh, both of these were frankly crises before uh pandemic the pandemics just made them worse um when it comes to housing frankly canada's housing market is out of control uh, we haven't regulated the cost of housing and we've allowed foreign investment to drive the cost up dramatically of houses so what we want to do is we want to construct 500,000 affordable not-for-profit homes in order to force a downward trend on the cost of rent i mean right now canadians are spending over 30 percent of their income 
on rent in many places. And that's simply not sustainable. So we want to give a better alternative and that will force competition in the market. We also want to increase taxes on major landlord investors and foreign investors in order to start pushing major uh, real estate ownership out of the rental market and allow for either smaller rental community or for not-for-profit cooperatives. Um, but we start by creating that alternative. And what's nice about that solution is it also necessitates creating a great deal of jobs to actually construct those homes. However, there's the serious issue of the student debt crisis. There's this, um, I'm not sure if you're partial to memes, um, but there's this meme that floats around that I can't stand. And it's uh, millennials killed and in, insert any industry here. And it's usually a, a luxury industry, something people want to do, eating out um, or going to the movies, things that they make life fun. Um, and you know, industries that allow for small businesses to grow. And it is true that my generation isn't spending money on it, but that's not because we don't like it. We love those kind of things. We can't afford to, that's the problem. And it's because we are one of the most overeducated, underpaid and indebted generations in history. We are paying predatory loans in our student debts. It gets as high as 3.5%. And asking an 18 year old or a 19 year old to sign on to a 40, 50, $60,000 loan at a 3.5% interest rate, that's predatory. There's no other word for it. I'm sorry, that's just predatory. And we wanna end those interest rates bring them to 0%. Ideally, I'd like to see a point where we have free post-secondary education. I think it should be universal hands down, but at least getting rid of those interest rates, that's a good start. Along with canceling up to $20,000 of student debt. Personally, I would support canceling far more than that, but as a policy platform, it's a good start. And canceling that debt combined with getting rid of those interest rates will actually allow students to do what right now seems impossible pay off their student loans. There are paradoxical situations right now where students are finding themselves after 10 years paying $35,000 in a $30,000 student loan and they still have that student loan because of the interest rates. So if you cut the interest rates to 0%, which is how it ought to be, because education is an investment, it should not be a profit. And if you cancel $20,000 of that debt, you can actually let students end their student debt and finally begin to participate in the economy, which means less small businesses close it because it's all circular. The more money people have to spend in the economy, better the economy works. All of this comes back to having an active government, which is actually trying to address inequality, which the other parties really aren't doing to the degree that we are. COVID itself has turn this, our, our community, our society um, on its ear. And I'm wondering what your party's position is on the various public health matter, measures that have been introduced. I mean, 18 months ago, we were all locking down. Now we're all um, rolling up. We hopefully we've rolled up our sleeves, um, but we do, we're on also on the cusp of the next wave. And if uh, the experts are to be um, uh, taken seriously, another month, well after the election, we could be in a, in a very serious position. What's the what's the party's position on the public health measures that have been taken, uh, and where, where do you want to see us going forward? Um, well, one thing that the party recognizes as a public health measure, um, bringing you back to economics, is the economic burden of a lockdown. Um, take the U.S., for example. In the United States, most states asked their population to simply go into lockdown without any economic support or recourse. And what happened is their lockdowns failed quite quickly. Because if you're giving people the choice between possibly getting sick or definitely losing their home, they will choose possibly getting sick. Which is why the NDP wants to continue the CERB program, expand EI, and to keep CERB at $2,000 a month, and to maintain the wage subsidy at 75% so that employers can still keep their employees on the payroll, and to support small businesses that are renting out establishments during COVID-19 in order to stay open. Because we understand that you can't have a lockdown if people are afraid of losing their homes. Um, and so as a personal story, I remember when the first lockdown actually happened, I was uh, supplying at the time. And unfortunately, because it's not a supplying as a contract position, it basically meant that uh, I would have no income. 
And I remember for the first uh, week and a half of the pandemic, I thought I was going to lose my home. Um, and it was only because of Serve that I didn't, um, that I was able to actually make ends meet. Um, and I don't think a lockdown is going to be successful unless we start by thinking about how we're going to keep people in their houses in the most literal sense and being able to afford them and being able to support them economically. Uh, the NDP is in favor of federally mandating vaccines for federal workers. Um, the provincially, that's a different question, of course, what the provincial mandates are. We can't as a federal government mandate, everyone get the vaccine. The provinces have to take care of industries that are within provincial control. Um, but uh, what we are in favor of uh, is prioritizing safety. We're in favor of shutting down whatever needs to be shut down in order to stay safe and giving that financial support because you can't just shut down. Just shutting down isn't enough. The U.S. tried that and it was a disaster. Um, and originally, the Liberal government only wanted to give $1,000 to serve for four months. And 18 months into the pandemic, I think we can all say with assurity, that wouldn't have been enough. Which is why we, um, I don't want to say forced, but negotiated with them to extend CERB uh, significantly throughout the pandemic and to increase CERB to actually be a successful program. Well, let's uh, pivot a little bit. Um, one of the things that has been characteristic of this election campaign in particular are various hate crimes, and Islamophobia and acts of assault on candidates. The most recent was uh, people throwing uh, gravel at the prime minister. Um, um, your leader has suffered, uh, been personally insulted by, by people who have made racial um, insults to, to his face. What does your party say about these incidents, and uh, what plans do you have to work towards a more fair and just society? Um, uh, frankly, equality is at the very bones of our party. Um, our party prides itself on representation and inclusiveness. Um, I, I really I can't say in stronger terms uh, that we simply don't tolerate uh, violent, bigoted behavior. Um, and frankly, the attacks on Jagmeet Singh has demonstrated that, uh, that that exists. And I'm honestly quite proud of my party for standing by Jagmeet Singh uh, throughout this. Um, it has been painful to see that that racial impetus still exists. Uh, the NDP is firmly in favor of trans liberation of LGBTQ liberation, um, of black representation, indigenous representation, representation of women. And we also want to go further. Um, this It's just an issue that doesn't come up very, very often, but as an example, uh, menstrual equality is a question that really doesn't get much attention. And that is that uh, individuals who menstruate are asked to purchase menstrual products at their own expense, despite those being a necessary hygiene product, which means that there are people who um, are unable to access them and are therefore subjected to significant indignity. Um, and frankly, that's discriminatory uh, because there's that generally affects women. Um, now, the uh, some parties have begun to join us in our call, but it was actually, I'm proud to say, the NDP was the first party in 2015 to advocate for no taxes on uh, menstrual hygiene products. And in 2018, we have begun to advocate for the absolute unquestion free access of these products to actually create a subsidy necessary to provide these products throughout the country to everyone that needs them. And this is why I like the NDP, because we look ahead on these issues of equality. And we are open to and we're listening to ways in which our society is unconsciously unfair, including questions such as menstrual equality. And what's wonderful about the NDP is our, our party was just about always the first one to take a stand on these issues, um, including uh, menstrual equality. Um, so we want, what we also want, and I, I'd be loath not to mention uh, the uh, indigenous. Um, while I am glad that some attention has finally been paid to the horrors of the residential schools, 
I frankly was appalled and continue to be appalled by the fact that the Liberal government uh, did not initially give any financial support to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in uh, finding Indigenous graves. And uh, they also continue to fight with survivors in court over compensation, while simultaneously saying in their platform that they wish to give compensation. Uh, the NDP is vigorously in favor of recompensation, and we are vigorously in favor of healing, which includes making significant investments in reserve communities. Justin Trudeau promised potable water six years ago for Indigenous communities, and despite having majority government four of those years and having full NDP support, it hasn't happened. The NDP want every Canadian, regardless of race, to have access to potable water because we can afford it, and that is the country we are. As Jugmeet said, if this was happening in Toronto, it wouldn't be a question about money. And I couldn't agree with him more. And part of creating an inclusive society is recognizing when we have failed to provide the same living standards to everyone based on race, and then ameliorating it. And we have been doing that for years, and we continue to do it. Let's shift a little bit because you've you've given a very comprehensive response to to what is uh, are some very significant issues. Let's talk a bit about climate change. We've been warned that we're running out of time. What's your party's position on climate change? Our position is uh, the term climate change is outdated. To be honest, uh, our position is it's a climate emergency. Um, and if I can uh, quote a friend of mine, as he likes to put it, we're at a point now we have to make game time decisions. Our party essentially is determined to move away from emissions as fast as humanly possible. We want to reduce emissions in our electrical production to zero percent by 2040. We want to reduce our emissions overall as a country by 50 percent by 2030. The hard truth to swallow is Canada is one of the most significant emitters of, of, uh, of, of CO2 pollution in the world, largely because of the uh, tar and oil sands out west. Um, we are, in terms of our population, uh, with respect to the size of our country, we're actually more significant contributors in the United States, which is a shocking fact. Um, and what we want to do is we want to shift energy production to green energy basis. What that means is moving away from oil and gas and moving towards renewable sources like wind, um, elect, uh, hydro dams, um, solar power, and where possible geothermal. Um, and this requires money, but it also gives us a real opportunity. Right now, the Liberal government wants to set another $18 billion to oil and gas subsidies, the same systems that are quite literally killing our planet, or rather killing us on the planet. Um, we want to halt that, we want to redirect it towards green energy production. This means creating hundreds of thousands of new cutting edge jobs in engineering and in the sciences and in construction to create an entirely new energy grid. And as I mentioned before, we have an overeducated population of millennials, many of whom would be fantastic in these lines of work. So what we're proposing to do is a Green New Deal. We want to invest huge amounts into our, into our economy to create excellent, high-paying, professional jobs for youth who are waiting for these opportunities in order to save our planet. Because frankly, if we can cut our emissions in Canada by 50%, that would be quite significant to not only playing our role in stopping climate change, but setting a standard for the rest of the world to follow. Because the truth is, under the conservative and liberal governments, we have fallen so short of the Paris Accord, it's shocking. And we are getting to a point where if we don't turn this around and soon, it could mean tremendous, catastrophic loss of life. We've seen even the hurricanes just last week in the United States. The reality is the apocalypse is happening. It just hasn't come to us here yet, but it's on its way. And if we don't change it, we are going to get to a point where it's too late. And I think that's coming quickly. One of the questions that's often asked of the NDP is, how do you intend to fund these proposals? Uh, that, that, that these are different proposals. They're, they appear to be very expensive proposals. What's the plan for funding? 
I'm glad you asked. Um, now, the specific funding uh, package is still, like the rest of the parties, we're still developing the very specific numbers, but I can give you a broad overview. Uh, the first thing is closing the tax loopholes and increasing taxes for the extreme wealth income uh, earners in this country. Because the reality is, we're an extremely rich country, but in the last several decades, we have been cutting services, increasing taxes for lower income middle class Canadians, and decreasing taxes for the ultra wealthy. Once upon a time, the majority of the tax burden was actually on corporations and wealthy Canadians. Then it became half and half. Now the majority of the tax burden is actually on working Canadians. And the result of that is, is we are losing a ludicrous amount of revenue, which is essentially being sent through tax loopholes to offshore accounts, and then we never see it again. By closing these loopholes, by forcing these individuals to pay their fair share, and frankly, forcing the folks who have made the va who have made billions in this pandemic, forcing them to pay their fair share will raise more than enough revenue for these initiatives. Not to mention halting pro-carbon uh, pro carbon emissions uh, subsidies, such as the $18 billion I mentioned previously. Rerouting those subsidies away from wealthy oil barons and away from uh, CEOs, and instead routing them towards green energy public infrastructure, along with closing tax loopholes and making the wealthy pay their fair share and pay back some of the tremendous amount of money that they have made in this pandemic, will easily fund these programs. But the best part is, once we start, we get an upward movement. The neoliberal proposal on economics pretty much boils down to, if you make life cheap for the wealthiest, the money trickles down. It's been 40 years since we started experimenting with that, and I, we're all still waiting for the money. I haven't seen it. I've been around for 30 of those. I haven't seen any of that money. The opposite proposal, the investment strategy of the economy, is that every dollar spent by the government generates $3 in revenue. Because as you create high paying jobs, you allow individuals to spend more in the free market. This means that private markets are able to have greater consumership, meaning that they can expand uh, their businesses, meaning they can hire more people. And with more competitive high wage government jobs, the private sector has to match or exceed these, meaning that the individual profits of working people also go up, meaning their spending power goes up, meaning more money is cycling throughout the economy, and that means more people can pay higher taxes, and that means the overall tax revenue goes up. For every one dollar we spend, we'll get three back or we can cut tax for the wealthy and it can all go to an offshore account in the Cayman Islands, we'll never see it again. Personally, I think the former's a better strategy. So how can we afford it? The better question is how can we afford not to do it? <laughs> very good point, Chris, very, very good point. Um, I presume that all of this is tied into the economic recovery from COVID, so it's a, it's a kind of a, a big picture platform that you've, you're presenting to us today. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I really see, I mean, we're going through a crisis with COVID. Um, and I know this is the, one of the oldest, uh, one, of, one of the oldest idioms in the book, but you know, the old one about uh, some, in some cultures, the characteristic for opportunity and crisis are the same. Uh, I think that's true here. I think that when a society goes through a significant crisis historically, it becomes an opportunity for renewal. The Great Depression was the culmination of everything that was wrong with unfettered, out of control, unregulated market capitalism. Um, and what we got out of that was a new deal. We had a revitalization of the economy. We had a responsible government investing again in good economic practices and creating labor equality. And what came out of that was two decades of tremendous economic growth until, unfortunately, we experimented with neoliberalism again and we lost most of those gains. When we have crisis, we can use that as an opportunity. And we're facing a lot of crises right now, but I see all of them as opportunities. The housing crisis is an opportunity to create good, even well, excellent, affordable and environmentally friendly homes. I didn't get a chance to talk about that, but trust me, we can make them environmentally friendly. You can get two for one. The climate crisis is an opportunity to create hundreds of thousands of good, high paying jobs that we need in blue and green and white collar. These are opportunities if we choose to make them opportunities or we can waste it. 
That's a very interesting perspective, Chris, because it's a, it's one that um, the, the idea that, that the crisis is opportunity is not one that uh, I think is particularly uh, well framed in this election campaign. Well, thank you. I um I think in times like these we have to be optimistic. Um and and we it, it, it's it's real. We can really do this, if we think big. Um, one of my favorite sayings is uh, is uh, pessimism of the spirit, optimism of the will, which means to say, accept the reality of what's happening and things aren't perfect, but believe you can make them better and make the best of them, and you will. I really believe that, but we have to come together to do it, and that's why I'm running. Because I really believe we have the power to come together and do incredible things. And we can save this situation. We can save it for our children and our children's children. But we have to act now. We're out of time. We cannot procrastinate any longer. This is it. Let me ask you a, a more practical question. Um, the, this election is obviously very different because we've got a lot of um, uh, restrictions placed upon us by public health measures. But where, if people were to want to uh, meet you and have a conversation with you, where, will, where would that be a good place to do that? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, so there are a lot of ways to contact me. Um, our, I, I wish I had the phone number for our office on hand. I, I'm afraid I don't have it on hand. Um, but uh, the best ways to contact me are through either sending me an email, uh, which is Christopher.Newdorf at NDP um, at uh, Outlook. Um, you can also call the office and your message will be relayed to me. Um, and you can also contact us through our various social media sites. We have an Instagram page, a Facebook page, and we do check the messages. I promise. It's actually a lot of fun checking the messages. Um, and sometimes the best way to do so is if you happen to be in Owen Sound, come on by the office sometime. We're on 2nd Avenue. We'd love to see you. It's in the 700 block, which is just south of the city hall, correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, so Sorry? Just should be pretty easy to find. Second Absolutely. Avenue East, just south of the City Hall. Yes, I just, I'm embarrassed to say I don't have the address in front of me. It's ironic because I'm in the building. Um, <laughs> I have this terrible habit for addresses. I recognize the building. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, it's not, it's just south, as I recall, it's just south of the City Hall, so it should be fairly easy to find. Oh, uh, yes, it's, it's across the street and half a block up. <laughs> yeah, that's about right. That's about right. Are you doing any any meet and greets uh, for people? We've just got about a minute left. So I just wanted to ask you, are you, are you meeting people in person? Um, well, in person, what we're doing for in-person meetings is canvassing. Um, we are doing online town halls for meeting. Uh, that way we just feel it's a little safer for people and it's a little easier for folks to uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to participate with us. Um, so uh, when we post those to our social media, um, so anyone who's interested, uh, take a look at social media. We share as much as we can. It's 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 uh, right there, ready to go. Um, I'm also going to be hopefully speaking at the climate march tomorrow, but that's they're going to come to me. It's that's a nonpartisan organization. They're coming to all the candidates, uh, but I will be there uh, for when they arrive at our office. Um, and I know we have other events, and I'm that's okay. Chris, on on. We we got to wrap it. So I want to thank you, Chris Newdorf, who is the candidate for the NDP in Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you for your time today and the conversation. And uh, we'll be right back with another interview with another candidate from Bruce Gray Owen Sound. I'm David Sherman. This is Politically Speaking, Election Edition. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Leonard Thompson, 13 years old, diabetes mellitus, 65 pounds. Starve the child to let them live. The treatment's as cruel as the disease. It's a death sentence. Dr. Banting, this could be it. He's the first to receive this trial. But will it save him? not pure enough so we try again and again and again before the discovery of insulin 
Diabetes was a death sentence. Banting, Best, Collop, and McLeod's breakthrough has saved millions of lives. Leonard Thompson's was the first. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome to Politically Speaking Election Edition. I'm David Shearman. My guest today is Michelle Lawrence, who is the candidate from the Green Party here in Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Michelle, welcome. Good to have you here on Politically Speaking. Thank you, David. <laughs> now, Michelle, you, this, is, uh, this is your first um, run as a candidate, is, is it not? It is, yes. So the big question is, why? Why are you running? We'll get to the Green Party in a moment, but why are you, what, what caused you to, to run? Uh, it just felt like time to step up. Um, we have this, this odd election period um, that we're all thrown into, and uh, it just gave me the chance to be involved because it was so odd. So um, I, I put my name forward and they said, go for it. And then, um, and I know that I'm, very politically involved in my life and I I care about a broad range of issues and um, have, have worked many different jobs so um, I really want to understand society and how to improve society as as just a daily action in my life so it was appropriate to try this and figure out how it all works yep that's, that's why I'm doing it <laughs> okay um, I mean, politics is kind of like there's there's old hands at it, but there's also um, a lot. If people don't step up, if people don't respond when they're asked, it's uh, mm -hmm. uh, our political system really doesn't go very go very far. Um, mm -hmm. So, kudos to you for stepping up and saying, "Okay, I, I want to do this." Mm -hmm. But what's your background? What what, uh, what is your your work work life? Um, right now I'm an RPN, so that's Registered Practical Nurse, and I work in long-term care locally. And um, before that I was farming, so I came up to this area to do a farm apprenticeship and then worked on another farm for a woman who's having a baby, and then I ran my own business for a year, um, a market garden. And, uh, and after that I retrained as a nurse. Uh, my partner's a nurse as well. so. Um, yeah, and it really came down to I wanted to do ecological farming, but it was it was very very challenging as a startup. Like I, I didn't have um, I didn't have money set aside to to buy farmland basically, and my parents were not farmers because they lived in the city. So, well, so you've got a, a real hands-on connection with the agriculture the agricultural uh, segment here in Gray County. Yeah, I'd say so. I know that it's very diverse, so I don't want to claim that I know it all. But um, I did have the privilege of meeting some really kind farmers that were trying their best to treat the land well. And um, um, so I, I worked with a farm near Durham, which was a community shared agriculture system. So they have people that just subscribe to their, their vegetables and they're their consistent customers all summer or all, all six months of the year that they can provide vegetables. Um, it's a very specific example, but it's one of the ways that you can have kind of a, a stable income as a farmer because you have these repeated customers that just, they give um, money up front at the beginning of the season and you have it no matter what the weather is. Um, so that's an example of how these farmers are really adapting to our current system. Well, I, I would say that if you have dirt under your fingernails, you're a farmer. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah so. but I know that it's so varied. I guess that's the point I'm trying to make, right? Like the type of farming that I did is is just one of the various types. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. 
but but as a as an RPN, you've also got uh, a hand in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just the way that I was raised, I guess, just very, very uh, well rounded, I think, and trying to understand. Like I went to school for visual art. Yeah, that's what my university degree was. So um, um, I've definitely worked a lot of different jobs and just trying to understand, like, okay, what is everyone trying to achieve, and uh, why are why are wages so vastly different in every career and yeah um yeah so lately i've been a nurse and that was mostly because the partner i met is also a nurse and it's it's very satisfying because you can help people just like every day you're just helping people so sure well it sounds like you had a natural alignment with the green party then oh definitely i think that's also why it was easy to step up because you i read the platform and it's it's just advocating for for healthy a healthier society that's easy to do well, one of the things that covid has done and uh, i'm sure as an rp and you you that's been your dare i say bread and butter of your work although you're in long term care um, of your work since you you started um, covid has exposed a, a significant amount of economic inequity in this country Things like um, job availability, child care, uh, mm -hmm. guaranteed livable income, those kinds of things. What What's your party's position on, on uh, COVID recovery and things like um, child care and guaranteed livable income? Um, the Green Party proposes a guaranteed livable income, and I think now is a time where that seems most uh, possible because we saw... Um, the social assistance that came in in the form of CURB or CERB and um, um, and those payments are are actually higher than people receive on social assistance. So um, it just shows you that the average person is valued a little bit higher than those that are the most vulnerable in our society on a regular basis, um, like people who are getting disability payments. Um, so guaranteed livable income is a way to kind of rebalance our society. There, there are corporations and individuals that have profited over this pandemic, and um, and their their figures are just shocking. Like two thousand people globally have about four trillion more dollars than they did before the pandemic. <laughs> um, so, so we we talk a lot about deficit these days, but I just yeah, forefront of my mind is that it's because of inequality that we're in a deficit. And the, the poorest of people have had to to shoulder the burden of, of this pandemic. They show up to work. They, um, they're doing the essential work through this pandemic, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the party's position on um, child care availability? Because uh, here in Grey Bruce, we're, we're well aware, uh, actually Bruce Gray on Sound, we're well aware that um, child care is not what it could be or should be, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, lost child care spaces in the pandemic. And uh, what's the party's platform on, ch on um, universal child care? Yeah, well, we lost child care spaces, I think, because it was um, less safe during the pandemic. Um, they were just being closed down for the, the fact of public health issues. But... Um, um, guaranteed livable income can help parents pay for childcare. Um, and I know myself, we, we relied on family members or friends, um, to, to take care of my two year old when like I was going to school during a period and my partner was working. So, um, yeah, in whatever way that you seek to, to do childcare, whether it be one or two days a week or full time, um, people can afford that. Another way is is the uh, Canada Child Benefit. Um, so that is be, has been under the Liberals increased um, incrementally uh, to fight poverty. And um, yeah, parents of young children and single parents of young ch children are, are kind of a category that's harder hit by poverty in our country. Um, and that gives people choice. But other than that, I guess training Training staff to be to be opening up daycares. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Let's let's switch this up a little bit because um, uh, as recently as the, the day we're recording this, um, refugees from Canadian citizens and um, uh, refugees from Afghanistan are arriving in um, on their way to Canada. What's the party's position on immigration? Um, it's it's just a reality in Canada. We have a pretty low birth rate, and our our economy economy has always been um, built up supported by immigrants. Like um, we we need immigrants to run our society. Um, and other than that like going into climate change we're we're having more and more migrant issues migrant um crises around the world and it's i think it's a humanitarian duty to to be taking in people who are in crisis um yeah okay as a as a um as a health professional uh, yourself as a um healthcare worker you you probably have, have you've been on the front line with respect to uh, COVID. What's your 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 position and your party's position on the public health measures that we're all dealing with? Um, immunization, masking, vaccination certificates, that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, I'm comfortable following the experts and the scientists and uh, public health um, their their decisions as to go forward. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's a tough topic because we have about um, 60 to 70% people vaccinated in Canada. And I just feel that if the people who haven't come forward to get vaccinations at this point is going to be um, a, a, a bigger conversation with them and um, why, why it is helpful for our society to be uh, preventing outbreak of disease and um and i think there are there are populations in canada that have had a really traumatic history with public health with our with our country um indigenous people included where that trust is is not there and um for a good reason um we we're, we've been talking about residential schools lately but um it's been it's been just it's just this horrible history where um indigenous people have been have been uh like te they've had testing you know like they've uh they've been subjects of of experimentation in our past it's just yeah uh very traumatic the way that they've been treated by the state and um so I respect that there are groups that are are harder to to have that trusting relationship with. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, speaking of of the um, residential school situation, um, certainly the discovery of of graves on the sites of Indian residential schools. Let's not use the word discovery, perhaps the right. uncovering, because they were they were known uh, to at least the indigenous community long before uh, we ever listened. Uh, has prompted a great deal of reflection, reflection and grief in Canada, and uh, mm -hmm. on the uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. What what will your party do to work towards Indigenous reconciliation? I mean, it's uh, it's it sounds so easy, but uh, we know it's not. But what would the Green mm -hmm. Party? Um, well, obviously, funding needs to be improved, and that is that directly will. Funding to um, uncover these grave sites and um, have an inquiry and uh, legal proceedings with people at fault. And um, the other step is funding to deal with the trauma, the, the generational trauma, um, funding healing centers, and beyond that, the the responsibility to to fund basic services in First Nations communities, um, be it education, clean water, um, health care, and all the things that their bound councils 
spend councils have been asking for. Uh, I feel at the federal level, it is, it's that responsibility to give equal funding. Another issue is the child welfare system um, needs to be investigated and each child in the indigenous welfare system is funded less than kids outside of that particular system. Uh, so it's like this whole broad range of support that we need to give that has been due for a long time. Sure. It's a, it's certainly a complex situation and complex issue. Um, let's, let's switch it up again and talk a bit about one of the, um, well, one of the issues that was has been alluded to, certainly, well, I shouldn't say alluded to, has been experienced on the uh, campaign trail so far. We have seen examples of uh, attacks on politicians. I think of the uh, egging of Mr. Bernier, the gravel that was thrown at the prime minister. Um, your own leader um, has spoken of disrespectful comments which have been made to her and uh, and so on. And we know that uh, hate crimes and issues of uh, Islamophobia are uh, par are becoming or seem to be on the increase in this country. What's your party say about those incidents, and uh, what what are your plans to work towards perhaps a more fair and a just society? Um, there is no room for for hate speech, hate crimes, and uh, we need to be accepting of everyone. Um, Yeah, I, we, we live in such a polarized time that people feel that that every opinion matters, but if you are breaking the law and, and threatening others, there's no place for that. Um, yeah. I have some, the here, here in Owen Sound, the police have reported a fair amount of sign vandalism. Have you had the same kind of experience as a candidate? No, we have not. Um, not that I've noticed. Um, yeah, and it is illegal to damage to damage election signs. Uh, but we have we have laws in place and um, to to uh, arrest people who are breaking the law. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's hope that uh, uh, because it is a crime. It's not just a, a parking ticket. <laughs> it's a serious crime. Uh, let's hope that your sign your signs are not vandalized. It's a that's an awful feeling to have them vandalized uh, at any point. Doesn't matter which candidate you are, uh, love them or hate them, just leave them alone. Anyway, okay, let's let's go to. Um, Another issue, which is probably, uh, dare I say, the bread and butter of the Green Party, and that is climate change. And climate change, well, here in Owen Sound, we are uh, the the, the um, days of action for climate, the marches for climate are are now returning. They've started up again because uh, we have under fewer outdoor restrictions. And uh, I understand we had about 150 people show up at the most recent one here in Owen Sound after they've started back again. But and we've been told that uh, we're at a tipping point in this country, in this world, about climate change. What's your party's position on climate change and what do you propose to do about it? The Green Party proposes a 60 percent reduction in emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. And this is sharper reduction than the other parties are proposing. And I guess it's uh, fairly obvious that the Green Party is more aggressive on climate change because it's a huge change in our system to be able to adapt to climate change appropriately. And I think the other parties aren't daring enough to, to take it seriously because maybe one excuse is that the terms are four years and no one politically we're not committing to long-term goals perhaps um and uh we hear we hear the other parties say that their plans have been assessed by um by these uh programs that 
that have rated them as appropriate for or current climate change hazards, but re in reality, they are not going to meet the, the targets that we set in the Paris Climate Agreement. And we're currently not, not meeting those targets. So one way to, to achieve the target at the end of the decade is to have smaller targets every year. And that's one thing that's unique to the Green Party platform is having yearly targets for, for reduction in emission um, and reassessment every year. Because it's, um, we're going to see huge changes between 2030, 2050, where the sea level rises, there's huge heat waves, droughts, and um, um, it's, it's, so, it's so stressful to, to read the, the recent report and, and think of all the things we don't know and we are not in control of. So um, I really urge people to think of the Green Party and, and our, our future beyond two to, five, two to four years. So you, you're saying that these are longer term issues that need longer term solutions and the Green Party offers them? Yes. Does the Green Party have any policies about things like um, uh, emissions free vehicles? Do you propose one of the more popular programs that we had here in Ontario a few years ago until it was cancelled mm -hmm. was uh, subsidies? Mm -hmm. Now, I think there are still some minor subsidies, perhaps at the federal level, yeah. but the province cancelled their subsidies for um, electric and uh, no, um, non-polluting vehicles. Uh, d does your platform include that kind of, um, shall I say, carrot? <laughs> or, <laughs> or towards carrot? Yes, it's true. We, I, we do need incentives because um, I think that's how you bring people along, is, uh, and especially people who are committed to their daily jobs and their daily routines, we need to have um, things that make it possible to adapt in, uh, given the time they have to do so. So the Green, the Green Party um, will fund electric vehicles and um, the ways to, to fund green tech come from a wealth tax, taxing the wealthiest in our society, the billionaires that, uh, that have profited over the past few years and and um, allowing allowing people to 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 buy up green tech in their lives. Another thing is um, retrof retrofitting buildings. That's another another thing that the Green Party proposes, so that we have more energy efficiency. I noticed that in the U.S. Not that we are in the U.S. Obviously, but in the U.S., Mr. Biden has said uh, he wants fifty percent of electricity in the United States to be to come from solar within wow. a few years, uh, yeah. which is certainly an eyebrow raiser given, uh, you know, the parts of, now parts of the U.S., obviously it would work, but parts where it wouldn't. Um, mm -hmm. But does the Green Party have any incentives for that as well, things like solar and wind? Um, yes, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things that will have to be set up because currently we are we are subsidizing the fossil fuel in fuel industry, so all of those subsidies will have to be exchanged for for subsidies with wind and solar around around the country and different types of networks because we need types of batteries to store and transfer that energy. Um, so yes, it's a great investment, and and it will it will have to be incentivized by the government so that it's affordable for people to adapt. Don't forget charging stations too. <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Up here, that's definitely an issue. We were considering an electric vehicle in our family, and and that's something that that isn't quite up to speed up here. That's not possible to drive with an electric vehicle very far. Yeah. Yes, it's almost as if you, you dare I say it, the, the charging station stations are well camouflaged. Aside from the Tesla station at Walmart. <laughs> Uh, there, there, is a, there are several around town here in Owen Sound, but you got to know where to look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's part of it. Yeah, and so some of it is um, actual employers that have um, installed them for their company. But uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a network where you can Google where the closest ch station is, but uh, soon it will become that way. Yes. Yes, I, I uh, 
I discover that one of the car dealers has a charging station way in the back. Oh. <laughs> and um, I discover, I know that one of our hotels here in the city has one charging station. Okay. And That's good so to know. They're there, but they are, <laughs> you know, you've got to, they're, they're in the back, they're hidden. So huh. I, I presume that the Green Party would want to, to have, uh, one, by the hotel, one for the hotel is for guests only. Uh, but I think the, you know, the, the idea of more charging stations would get a lot of buy-in for sure. Mm -hmm. from we definitely need the infrastructure to do this. Yes. So it's a, it's a huge project. Yes. But it's, it's, a uh, lasting, we, we can't have emissions. We can't have air pollution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things I read about climate change from the international panel of climate change, they have a report that just came out, Yes. um, is that even if we stop all of our greenhouse gas gas emissions by 2030 by 2050 and past we, there are places on the earth that will still not have air pollution standards up to the the who standards um world health organization that air pollution will be lasting for for decades so um oh it's it's such a it's such a big overhaul of our system to 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 like correct kind of the values in our society, but it can be done and it just takes daring creative minds. Mm -hmm. And you hope that uh, as a, as a, an elected representative from the Green Party, you would be at that table to try and help make those changes? Oh, definitely. I, I, I would go to Ottawa, I would become an MP and I would fight for all of these things that I care about because I know that I'm I'm an extremely caring person and very curious about society and ways to, to improve everything. Um, so I'm ready to go there. <laughs> but, but it's also our children and grandchildren, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, as, a, as the parent of a, of, a, of a young child, which you alluded to, uh, I'm sure you're worried about the future for your children. Yeah, when you have a kid, there's this, this extra level of worry. You, uh, you feel so responsible for what you've handed them. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Did that play into your decision to 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 run for office? Probably yes. Yeah, yeah. You see yourself in your child's eyes, and you you uh, you expect more for yourself for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and and maybe you can leave this world a better place for your children. Oh gosh, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Well, yeah. the Green Party has had a has a, had a number of very interesting candidates over the years, um, and it, I think in a provincial election, actually ran second. So yes, uh, yes. Uh, looking at some of the stats here, we have a very unique riding in that the Green Party is is has been second runner up a few times, and I think it's something that brings us all together here because we're either here for leisure, enjoying the the natural space we have up here, or or people are farmers and directly are are um, their livelihoods depend on nature. So it is a big commonality here. Well, Michelle, I want to thank you for being a part of Politically Speaking and uh, best wishes in your election campaign. And uh, we hope that uh, things go well for you. And thank, thank you so much, David. And thank you, friends, for being a part of Politically Speaking Election Edition. I'm David Shearman. My guest has been Michelle Green of the Green Party. Let's talk again. response line email us or connect with us on social media october 5th 2014 my daughter was hit by a train she was walking along the sides of the tracks and it shattered her world <laughs> kid's been in jail five years. The American student. My daughter's innocent. 